Sounds good, 911. What is your emergency? Yes, um, my girlfriend went left last night and she hasn't made it back to the hotel. What is your name? It's Robert Early. I mean, I've talked to her parents, to her ex husband. She had, nobody's heard from her and she's pretty intoxicated. Hey, and where are you at? The Stevens Inn. Let me go ahead and have an, an officer come see you, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. On March 2nd, 2014, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, police received a 911 call from a man named Robert Early. He informed the authorities that his girlfriend had vanished and he had no idea where she was. At the time, Robert lived in the area and worked in an oil field. His girlfriend, Emily Lambert, a Dallas schoolteacher, was visiting him for the weekend. Emily's parents said Emily had called the previous day and she sounded normal and was in good spirits. The following day, her parents received a text message from her boyfriend, Robert, saying, Please call me. Her parents were very worried and immediately called him back. Robert stated that Emily had gone missing. They jumped in their car and started the long eight-hour drive down to Carlsbad, New Mexico, to meet with Robert and the police. The detectives set up a meeting with Robert in room 402 of the Stevens Inn Hotel, where they stumbled upon Emily's clothes and cell phone. To their surprise, her car was found parked outside with her purse abandoned on the passenger seat. Seeking more information on Emily's mysterious disappearance, the detectives requested Robert to accompany them to the police station, and he consented, appearing to be fully cooperative with the authorities. Robert Early is the only lead in the ongoing investigation. Had he not alerted the authorities about Emily's disappearance, law enforcement officials would have been oblivious to her absence. I met her in November, and we've pretty much been inseparable since. I mean, I moved in, like, really, if, I guess officially December. I mean, but it's, we, we pretty much, you know, our parents were out of town. We stayed at our parents' house. She stayed at my mom's house. Okay, how old is she? 30. Okay, how old are you? 33. Drove to Carlsbad, did the Carlsbad Cavern deal. She got her little passport book stamped, and then we went from there to Roswell, from Roswell, we went to a place called Tijuana's, mm -hmm. and we had uh, fajitas, and I had two margaritas, and she had one. And then we went from there to a place called Farley's. The detectives reviewed the pictures on Robert's phone, and it appeared that the couple had a pleasant time during their sightseeing activities. Additionally, the receipts for the bars that the couple had visited were examined, and they support Robert's account of events. You know, it was her last night in town, so we met up with my boss at the hotel bar and just got pretty much obliterated from there. Just a see-through completely. I mean, you'd have to probably really, in a darker bar like that, notice that she had some great hanging on. She was getting hit on by guys. She came back and said, hey, this guy said, uh, if he is not taking care of you good, I'll take you home. Some strange dude. I'm like, whatever, you know, Emily, if that's what you want, go ahead and go. You know, she didn't get the response from me. She wanted to fuck you, then I'm leaving. Uh, I figured she's going to go smoke, she'll blow off some steam. She'll be cool. And so that's why I left. I want to start thinking that. How come she didn't take her home? Because it was dead and we only needed one. We were, at the, we were going together. We were at the hotel. I mean, we walked over there. Went back to the room with the key. And she wasn't in there. And then I started pacing up and down and walking around. And I shut the door. Oh, what time did that was going on? Maybe a little bit after 12 or, or maybe 11.40 something in between 12, 20 and 11.40 something, I'm guessing. So you're saying she left with someone? And I didn't see her actually leave with somebody, but... She was talking about some dude that was leaving, you know. She, she, she's not at the hotel. She's not in the room. Where the f else was she had gone? Robert stated that he and Emily went to the hotel bar, which was corroborated by a witness from the bar. The witness stated that the couple was dancing and playing pool, and Emily was wearing a short skirt. Whenever Emily took a shot on the pool table, Robert would stand behind her to block the view. Robert also claimed that a man at the bar was showing interest in Emily, and she told Robert that she would go home with him. Robert said, fine, whatever you want to do. 
However, it appears that the couple argued about this man, and Robert believes that Emily left with him. You just don't seem the type of person to me that the girl comes up and says, F you, and turns around and walks off, and you let that happen. You don't strike me as that type, dude. I, you just don't. I mean, I, I, I know her. Y'all don't. Exactly. Upon reviewing the CCTV footage from the bar, the police observed Emily leaving alone which raises doubts about Robert's assertion that she left with the man from the bar. We, we talked to several people at the bar, and none of them see her leave with anyone. You know, I'm sitting here in my mind, and I'm, and I'm going to ask you this question. Hmm. I, I follow missing persons report, mm -hmm. and what's scaring me is I'm, I'm wondering why I'm being grilled so hard. Is everything okay? okay. Let, me, let me explain something. You were the last person to see her life. Okay, does that answer your question? No, I mean, hands down, you're the last person. Was well, it noticeable that y'all had an argument? I mean, not if there was someone sitting at the table next to you or in the area. Okay. I mean, it, we kept it. I kept it pretty much as discreet as I could. Robert is currently claiming that they did argue, but he remained composed and attempted to keep it low key. However, a witness from the bar reported that Robert was exceedingly angry with Emily and began grasping the back of her neck while pointing his finger directly in her face and shaking her aggressively. How's your temper? Uh, fights. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm never getting any fights. I mean, you're going to tell me that you don't have a violent temper. I don't have You're going to tell me that none of your friends are going to tell me that you're violent. None of my friends are going to say I'm violent. I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm not going to just sit there and get you know, But I've never been arrested for beating up somebody. I've never been on an altercation. Just because you're not arrested for it doesn't mean that you don't do it. You know what I mean? I have talked to some people in Dallas that say you do have a violent past. Who? I'm not going to tell you. The detectives are inquiring if Robert has a history of violence or anger issues. Upon contacting Robert's ex-wife and ex-girlfriend, they revealed that Robert has a significant propensity for violence. What's your gut telling you right now? Yesterday, I was having really, really bad tingly feelings, and, you know, that I just, I just hope she's okay. I mean, I I'm not she... asking you what you hope. I feel what your gut feeling right now. Bitch. I, I mean, I honestly think that, that she got involved with some wrong people, and she's either hurt or trapped, or somebody's got her not letting her go. Than that, I mean, uh, otherwise, why would she be back? Okay, well, I mean, do you think she's dead? I have no clue. I hope not. You know, that's the last thing I want for for my girlfriend and a mother of two and a school teacher. You know, when I have a daughter, I mean, I can imagine if I went missing, my daughter couldn't see me anymore or her mom. Emily has now been missing for three days, and the detectives are becoming increasingly concerned about her welfare. Robert is still their sole lead and they suspect that he may be withholding vital information from them. Consequently, the detectives requested that Robert undergo a polygraph examination to assist with their investigation. Robert, you really wanted to take a polygraph? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's about, probably about 10 a.m. in the morning. Nerves are shot. You know why you're here today? Because my girlfriend's missing. Put your left arm out in front of you. Come up. Emily Lambert is um, your girlfriend, the one that you were with Saturday night, is that correct? Yes. Do you intend to answer truthfully all questions regarding the location of Emily, Emily Lambert? Yes. Do you know where Emily Lambert is located? No. Do you know where Emily Lambert is located right now? No. The detectives have employed the Utah three polygraph technique, which involves asking three similar yet rephrased questions that all have the same significance. Essentially, this method involves posing the same question three times, but in different ways. You didn't pass. How? Um, it was asked three separate ways, um, and you didn't do well on any of the tests, any time I ask. I want to take it again. 
With the test results indicating a failure, Robert has now transformed from a witness to the primary suspect in the investigation. The detectives need to apply more pressure on Robert at this point. You know where she's at? I'll, I'll certain, Robert, hands, hands down, Lou. I was, hands down. I was hammered. I understand that. You're Lou. hammered, but did something happen, right? We know that. So I had an argument. She left, and that <sighs> your shoulders are pretty heavy, dude. Now you cross your arms. Your shoulders are heavy. I'm telling you right now, they are. Robert's body language is displaying indications of guilt, as evidenced by his hunched posture, which suggests he is carrying a heavy burden. When additional pressure is exerted on Robert, his story suddenly changes. You know, we got army, she left, and, you know, from the hotel, you know, I mean. Then what? I got in the car, tried to drive around and look for her, and you found her. No, no, I, ne I never did find her. I never did get to find her. I know she went in a vehicle. What was the vehicle? It was a... I think it was, uh, he had monster tires with uh, rock star wheels on it, white, extended cab truck. And she was, I mean, it was the guy who she was talking to, who she was talking to. You know more than you're saying, because you just gave us more information, whether it's true or not. I kind of think it's half-assed, okay? I'm not trying to be an ass to you, but we're dealing with life here, buddy. We're dealing with someone's life. I know we're not here to hammer on you. We're here to get the truth so we can possibly do something to help her. This isn't our first time to deal with this. And you deal with one of two kinds of people. One, some that accident happened. Or two, you deal with a monster. Yeah, and you're a monster. monster. Uh-huh. I said, I'm not a monster. You're not a monster. No. Convince me of that right now, because, dude, you coming forward with, with that right there and, and then saying that, and you've been hiding it for two days, I have a problem with it. I've been dreading this all the time. I, just, I thought she'd, they, he'd bring her back or took her off or something happened. I was sticking around. Dude was big. I mean. Okay. Start back when you're in the bar. Dude pulls up. Emily gets in his ride. I just pulled out and went the way that I seen them pull out of the steep. Where did they go? South? You went out? I went out the direction of the canal towards Walmart. Okay. Towards Walmart. South. He pulls up into some sort of looking like housing little area or something. Like a house or something. And by the time I get out, Emily barely had any clothes on, you know. And I pull up. We start, you know, beefing, and he comes running at me with a pipe, and she jumps in front of me, bam, hit her, right in the head. I mean, and I was like, God, you know, and he comes at me, I just got in the car, and just burned out, you know. And I waited it out because I didn't know what else to do. I've never been in this situation. I've seen movies and all the 48s and stuff. I mean, I, I'm guilt by association. You show me where the house is. Is it a crew cab? Was she bleeding? Robert claims that Emily was taken to a house in a white truck by the man she had been talking with at the bar and that he subsequently followed them there. According to Robert, when he exited his vehicle, the man from the bar charged at him brandishing a metal rod, but Emily stepped in between them and was struck over the head by the man. Upon witnessing this, Robert claims he returned to his car and left the area. The detectives accompanied Robert to the house he described during his interview. Upon arrival, they observed that the house appeared abandoned and dilapidated. As the detectives proceeded up the driveway, they instructed Robert to remain at the car and wait. He lit a cigarette and began smoking. While on the property, the detectives noticed two drag marks leading toward the rear of the house. Following the tracks, they discovered an old tin storage building. Continuing northward from there, they soon came across a body at the back of the property. Upon examining the body, they were able to identify Emily by her tattoos. Returning to their squad car, the detectives informed Robert of their discovery. To their surprise, he acted astonished and inquired, You found her? The detectives responded affirmatively, but also informed him that she was deceased. The detectives brought Robert back to the station, where they planned to extract the truth about what truly happened to Emily. All right, man. I know you haven't talked to me yet, okay? Okay. Um, you can get jealous. Jealousy is a powerful thing, man, especially when you're drunk. Does the severity of the crime, is there, 
it, it probably, you know, to not including myself in saying I'm saying anything, mm -hmm. but from your standpoint, would I ever see my kid again? So you gotta understand something. Right? And I also want a cigarette. Oh man, I've got, I've got you hooked up with cigarettes, yeah. So I smoke, smoke too, so. So we'll, we'll just go smoke a cigarette. Thing. I'll put it off. I'll smoke. Man, I'm tired of it, dude. Oh, God, I don't know much else. Let's go burn one, come back in there, and don't tell me everything that I can remember. Emily can get. She's so very strong, and she's bigger than any other girl I've been with. They ain't all lot stronger. And she. Yeah, after I, I mean, she was in the car, and I did all that stuff, and. I mean, I'll retell you, though. Come back in here with Robert has made a proposal to the detective, agreeing to disclose all that he knows in exchange for the opportunity to smoke a cigarette with the detective. As they stepped outside to smoke, Robert began to divulge precisely what had happened to Emily. I kicked her with my steel toe. You said you kicked her? I kicked her with the steel toe. You know, four times when she was out, I was like, oh, freaking out. I don't know what to do. Upon returning to the interview room, the detective requested that Robert reiterate the information he had shared while they were outside. Let's start from the beginning, man. And, like, no, didn't know nothing. What was the argument about, man? Uh, she said that, uh, some dude said that if I didn't treat her right, he'd take her home. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whatever, you know, whatever. If that's what you want, you know, go ahead and leave. We're done. It's over. I'm leaving you this and that. And I was like, really? And then uh, she was wanting to drive. That's what started the whole altercation in, in, in the room. She wanted to drink and drive and drive all the way back to Florida. And I said, no, you're not leaving. She started going crazy with me. And we started, you know, pushing around. And that's when she got my arm and bit the hell out of me. And it swept me back. And I put my head against the wall. And that's when I got up and hit her. And then I kicked her. You know, I told you I was lost. I mean, I was. You, where did you kick her the first time? I think in the mouth. Okay. But she was, I didn't decide to kick her in the mouth. She was still okay. She got up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? I was pretty shocked. You know, I was able to get her down. And I was shooting crazy. I was tripping out. I didn't know what was going on, you know. And I kicked her again there. Where'd you kick her that time? I think in the face. Okay. Crew was all headshots. Okay. Just laying there like breathing down no, no, like a weird breath and I was uh, I just, like she was knocked out. Yeah, and I didn't know what to do. And so I just I just, I was like, Oh my god, oh my god. And I just put her in the car and drove out there and so the kid behind that guy's house she came to and then she was coming at me, I grabbed that uh, air pump, and uh, I grabbed that and, and whacked her with it, and I whacked her with it a couple times. How did you drag her back to me? I know it's probably a thing to think about, but I mean, did you grab her and drag her back, or did you wrap her with something and drag her back? I grabbed her with something. Where did you wrap her with rope? It was just a, yeah, a quick, like a slip, and then just threw it around the passenger door, shut the door. After Emily departed from the bar and headed for her room, Robert followed closely behind. An argument broke out between the two in the room, during which Emily bit Robert on the arm. Enraged, Robert kicked Emily with his steel toe cap boots. Following this attack, Robert drove Emily to the abandoned house he had described earlier. There, he used an air pump to end her life. Afterward, he tied a rope around her neck and lodged it in the car door, dragging her lifeless body behind the vehicle for a distance of 110 feet. Even when describing how he repeatedly kicked and punched Emily to death, Robert remained emotionless. The prosecutors sought a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Robert Early was subsequently found guilty and received a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. He is currently serving his sentence at the Lee County Correctional Facility in Hobbs, New Mexico.